you have your Bibles, you can turn to the book of First Corinthians, otherwise we will read that text from the screen in a couple of moments. Uh, Maureen regrets that uh, she couldn't be with us today. Uh, we finally decided that our dog Mindy cannot take two trips uh, at the same time. She gets uh, car sick, so uh, we regret that uh, Maureen couldn't be with us today. But she'll be with us on the 25th, our, uh, our last Sunday here. Just a moment. Corinthians chapter 1, we will read verses 1 through 9. Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be holy, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, in your speaking and in all your knowledge, because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will keep you strong to the end, so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, is faithful. Let's bow together in prayer. Our God, it is our joy and it is our privilege to worship you, to proclaim your worth and your majesty. We praise you for your power, for your mercy, for your grace, for your love that is everlasting and which will never cease. We are awed that you have called us to be your people. It is not because of anything that we have done, but it is because of your mercy and your grace that you have called us out of the world to be your own people. And God, even as we have spoken in prayer this morning that we are broken and wounded, we do confess that reality, that we have sinned, that we have gone our own way so many times. And yet you call us back to yourself. You call us back to our first love. And God, today as a nation, we are broken. We are wounded. We pray that your hand of mercy may be upon our nation and, yes, all the nations of the world at this time. We pray that there may be peace where there has been strife. We pray that there might be love and forgiveness where there has been hatred. We pray that there might be reconciliation where there has been hatred and racism. We pray for our president and first lady today whether we're Republican or Democrat, it doesn't matter when we face a plague like the coronavirus. We pray for your mercy, we pray for healing. We know that there are other legislators and senators who also have tested positive. We pray for your healing and for those thousands in our nation and millions around the world who have lost loved ones and who are uh, suffering great physically. We pray for you to bring physical healing and spiritual healing to our land and to our world. Lord, what we need is
is not a political revolution or even a cultural revolution. We need a spiritual revolution, a revival of your work in our day. And this is what we yearn for, this is what we long for, this is what we cry out for, God, that you may do a mighty work even when we despair and have lost hope. So God, we bring ourselves to you. We thank you that you have given us your word, which is powerful. It speaks to our innermost needs, our innermost being. And even though these words were written thousands of years ago, we thank you that because of your Holy Spirit and the inspiration of your word, that these words are forever contemporary. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I was re recently uh, reading about the cities in America where the gospel is spreading most rapidly and where churches are being planted at uh, an even incredible rate. And at first I thought, well, what cities would that be? Uh, undoubtedly it, it must be a city in uh, the Bible Belt, perhaps Atlanta or, or Dallas or Houston. Or maybe it would be uh, the suburbs around Chicago where there's Wheaton College and Trinity uh, Divinity School and the headquarters of our denomination. Or perhaps it would be Charlotte, North Carolina, the Billy Graham Association, and all the influence that, that he has had. What city in the United States is the gospel spreading more than any other place. And I nearly fell off my chair when I saw at the head of that list of cities, Sin City, the Strip, that city where what happens there stays there, that city that is dedicated to every depravity and excess and immorality imaginable. Yep, that city. Las Vegas, Nevada. Of all places, God is at work, even there, especially there. And uh, you may have noticed that even in the cities in America where there seems to be the most turmoil these days, God is at work. Perhaps you saw the mini revival that happened in uh, the city in our own, in uh, the state of Wisconsin. Kenosha, where people were being saved and were being baptized out in the in the park, <coughs> where so much uh, other activity was going on. Now this should not surprise us because in Acts chapter 18 we hear Dr. Luke's account of what happened when the gospel first came to the city of Corinth. Uh, verses 1 and 7 through 11 of Acts chapter 18. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. Crispus, the synagogue ruler, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who heard him believed and were baptized. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision, Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. God at work in Corinth synonymous with luxury and looseness and lust, where there was the temple of Aphrodite, 
dedicated to sexual lust. There were over a thousand sacred prostitutes who did their activity in the name of worship. Can you imagine such a thing? And uh, this city was responsible for a new word in the Greek vocabulary, Corinthiazomai, which means to live a loose life of drunkenness and immorality. There was a proverb among the Greeks, it's not every man who can afford a journey to Corinth. Well, in the midst of this city, this depraved and immoral city, God plants his church, a young, vigorous, growing church, but it's a very immature church because four years after his visit, Paul writes a letter to this church that we now know as 1 Corinthians. And it was a church troubled by pride, division, sexual sin, marriage problems, a misunderstanding of worship, a misunderstanding of money, and a misunderstanding of spiritual gifts. You name it, if there was any possible problem that could appear in a church, it happened in the church in Corinth. Now that's bad news and good news. It's bad news because we're sad that this church in Corinth had so many problems, but it is good news because we profit by it. Their ancient struggles are present day problems as well from which we can benefit and learn. So today and the next two Sundays we're going to spend in 1st and 2nd Corinthians. I wish I had uh, six months to go through both of these books, but uh, I have to uh, decide on which of these problems I'm going to speak about. So I have chosen two that um, might make you glad I'll soon be leaving. Because next week I'm going to talk about sex, and the week after that I'm going to talk about money from 1st and 2nd Corinthians. So, uh, but before plunging into those two problems, uh, Paul spends nine verses talking about the fact that these people have been called. When he uses the word church, the word that's translated into our language as church, the original readers understood that he was saying the called out ones, those who have been called out of darkness to light, those who have been called out of sin to holiness, those who have been called out of individualism to a worldwide fellowship in Christ. So we want to see how this holy calling affects and is powerfully active in the past, the present, and the future. First of all, Paul refers to the past. And he said, it's those who have been called to be holy, those who have been sanctified. So first he's talking about the fact of salvation, those who have been saved from wrath and condemnation and separation from God. This is what God has already accomplished. He has called us, and now we call on Him. In verse 2, He says to those sanctified in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? To be sanctified means to be made holy, to be made separate from the world, to be blameless in God's sight through the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. This is what Christ has done, what he has accomplished, and what he has made us. It is a done deal. We are saved and we are sanctified. There was a young man at an evangelistic meeting who came up to the evangelist and said, what can I do to be saved? And the evangelist said, it's too late. And the young man replied that I would do 
anything. I'll go anywhere. I'll do anything to get this salvation. And the evangelist replied, it's too late. Because salvation was completed over 2,000 years ago by Christ on the cross. It is done. It is a finished work. All you have to do is receive it. And that's why in verse 4, Paul says, God gave you grace in Christ Jesus. You see, Christianity is not a sacrifice that we make. <clears throat> it's a sacrifice that we trust. Let me repeat that. Christianity is not a sacrifice that we make. It's a sacrifice that we trust. It's not a victory we win. It's a victory we inherit. There was an old <clears throat> violin maker uh, who took great pride in the instruments that he himself had fashioned. But one night, thieves broke into his establishment and stole his most prized violin. It was months later that uh, he saw that perfect instrument in the window of a pawn shop. Now he had no way to prove that that instrument once belonged to him, so he went back and dug into his savings nearly every penny he had, and he bought that instrument that really was his. That is what God in Christ Jesus has done. <clears throat> we were lost, twice lost, and we have been twice bought. We were gods by right of creation, but our sins separated us from God. And so God in Christ had to purchase us back. He has called us. He has a claim on us because of creation. But we willfully rejected him, and he needs to bring us back to himself. <clears throat> Someone said, how would you summarize the whole of Scripture? From Genesis to Revelation, what would be one phrase that would summarize the theme of the Bible? And um, I don't know who it was, but he was inspired when he says the summary of the whole Bible is that God is out to get back that which belongs to him. God is out to get back that which rightfully belongs to him. That's the theme of all of Scripture. And so rather than demanding that we pay the price, that we pay the penalty for our sin and rebellion, uh, he lays down his life. And the cross is the bridge that brings us back to God. So we are saved, we are sanctified, and uh, the whole summary of salvation is the fact that God searches for us. God is the hound of heaven. He searches and trails us until we surrender to his grace. That's the past. Now what about the future? Because our calling is not only an accomplished fact, but it's a dynamic activity that changes who we are and what we do right now. Verse 2, we are already sanctified in Christ Jesus. We are called to be holy. So what Paul is saying in effect is, here's what you are, now start acting like it. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, verse 18 says this, and we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So sanctification is an accomplished fact, but it's also a continual process. We are being transformed step by step into the likeness of Christ. Now, the question comes, well, how does that happen? Well, I think Paul in these nine verses answers that question. And the first way is through fellowship. He says, together 
with all those who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now is that just a cute little phrase, just a, a filler phrase? No. He's saying there is a sense in which we can only be all that we ought to be when we are together. We encourage each other. We build each other up. We challenge each other. We admonish and egg each other on. The author of Hebrews says in chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. In chapter 3, verses 12 and 13, he says this, See to it, brother, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. I, I've said this before, this uh, Hebrews chapter 10 is like we're, we're supposed to be a, a spiritual game. We're supposed to be a game for good. You know, we can do together what we would never dare to attempt by ourselves. And that's the way games are, you know, those individuals in the game would never do uh, what they do were it not for the encouragement of the other gang members. Well, we need to be a gang for good, spiritual gang. Bill Hybels uh, writes this, the Bible says that true fellowship has power to revolutionize lives. Masks come off. This obviously was written before 2020. <laughs> Masks come off. Conversations get deep. Hearts get vulnerable. Lives are shared. Accountability is invited. And tenderness flows. People really do, be, do become like brothers and sisters. They shoulder each other's burdens. And unfortunately, that's something that few of the people in our congregations have experienced. We have come to understand that the church is not a place to share your problems. When your life is unraveling, you go to specialists instead of standing up right where you are and saying, we need prayer, our marriage is in trouble. Christians shouldn't have problems, so we hide them. Abel said he didn't talk about his problems because he felt that a good Christian just didn't admit to having those kinds of real life difficulties. And in many churches, that's called fellowship. There should be nothing that keeps us from getting together. Nothing. We need to be together. So we do that through fellowship. And the second thing that Paul says here that helps that to accomplish is through serving. Let me read uh, verses 5 through 7 once again. For in him you have been enriched in every way, in all your speaking and in all your knowledge, because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift. We have been enriched. Why is it that God has poured out his riches upon us and among us? It's so that we may serve. He said you do that through speech, when you speak the truth in love to each other, and you do that in knowledge, when you share what you have learned. And Paul says his testimony has been confirmed in these pe people. Spiritual gifts, they are gifts 
of grace. Let's always remember that. If you have a spiritual gift, it is a gift of God's grace. It's not to be proud, but rather it is to serve, to be useful, to be part of the body. And this is a beautiful truth because it eliminates two of our temptations as human beings. It eliminates pride. If you have a spiritual gift that God is using, that you are using for God's glory, it cannot result in pride because it's a gift from God. It's God who receives the glory, not you. And so it eliminates pride. It also eliminates competition. When you see someone else that is more gifted than you, that has an outstanding spiritual gift that is using it, uh, you do not say, man, I sure wish I could be that and we become jealous and envious of that person. No, there is to be no competition. We, we praise God for the spiritual gifts that his people have. Now I asked a member of this congregation if I could use her as an example, and uh, it's Debbie Stoltenberg. Debbie some months ago said, I, I can't continue doing this. I, I just don't have what it takes. Please, is there someone else who could take my place? Well, apparently no one else came forward, and so to this day, Debbie leads us in worship. Not because she's super talented, but because she has a gift of encouragement, and she's using that to bless us. And I praise God I can use many of you other members of this congregation as examples as well. And so I would challenge each of us to kind of step across the line to depend on God and not yourself, to get in there, to get involved and discover the joy of serving. Others will be blessed and you will learn what faith is all about. I ran across this little uh, deal about how to kill a church. If you want to kill a church, never go to your church and meetings held there. If you do go, be late. It's no one's affair. If the weather is bad, either too hot or snowing, just stay home and rest where there will be others going. But should you attend, be sure to remember to find fault with the work each official and member be sure to hold back on your offerings and tithes. The bills will get paid by the rest of the guys. And never take office if offered the post, but eagerly criticize work of the host. If not on a committee your place, be sore. If you find that you are, don't attend anymore. When asked your opinion on this or that, have nothing to say, just turn them down flat. Then after the meeting, shine out like the sun by telling the folks how it should have been done. Don't do any more than you possibly can. Leave the work for some other woman or man. And when you see faithful ones work themselves sick, then stand up and holler, it's run by a click. That's how to kill the church. And praise God, that's not happening here. So, that's the past, the present, and now the future. In verses 7 through 9, Paul says this, Therefore do not, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God who has called you into fellowship with his Son Jesus Christ our Lord, is faithful. We eagerly await. That's talking about the future. 
Now, wait does not mean sitting around waiting for the clouds to part. That's why he put us together. So we wait together. We encourage each other as we wait. And he says, strong to the end. It's not so much how you begin. It's how you end. Finish strong. And the last thing he says, and the most powerful motivation, is God is faithful. The one who called you is faithful. You may not know exactly what you're doing or where you're going or what God has in mind. Therefore, trust Him. Serve Him. Honor Him. E. Stanley Jones, in conclusion, said this, Faith is not merely holding on to God. It is realizing that God is holding on to you, and He will not let you go. So faith is not so much hanging on to God with our finger fingertips, but it's rather realizing that, hey, God is holding on to us, and He won't let us go. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. So God has us covered, past, present, and future, and we can trust Him. Let's pray. God, we thank You that You are at work. You are at work where we would least expect it. You are at work when we can't see it. You are at work when it seems like the enemy has the upper hand. By faith, we believe that your <clears throat> plan and your purpose are being accomplished. We pray that that might be true in our individual lives, in our families, in our church, and yes, in our nation. We submit ourselves to you in faith. We thank you that even when we are desperate and hanging on to you by a fingernail, we recognize that you.